Welcome to West Windsor Arts Council's second virtual poetry reading, performed by the poets from Anna Evans's two fall classics, classes, and classics. My name is Joanne Sutera. I'm your co-host for today's event, along with Elaine Gutterman, a founding current board member and a fellow poet. Our first virtual reading in this COVID-19 Zoom world was in June, which now seems like a lifetime ago. And although COVID-19 remains with us, a promising vaccine is in the works. Gratefully, the election is over, we think. We have learned to navigate technology and have settled into our real and virtual lives such as they are. We are poets with societal upheavals, divisive news stories, real and fake, and fear of the unknown. We write, we record the past, the present, the future, in verse, meter, and rhyme. We compose, we draw comparisons in simile and metaphor. We create, we call up vivid images to illustrate the abstract. And like writers of other disciplines, we use humor and pathos to describe what we see and feel in the world we inhabit. And dear guests, we thank you. In today's challenging times, we are grateful for your donations to help the Arts Center continue its mission of cultivating the arts for individuals and communities. And also we thank you for just being here. Before we get into the um, program, a reminder, if you wish to applaud virtually, there are emojis at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Over to the right, um, you will see something that says reactions. If you hover your mouse over that area, just click on your favorite. Now, welcome to Poetry in a COVID-19 World. Please enjoy our performances. Here's my co-host, Elaine Gutterman. Hi, greetings. Um, I'm going to be introducing half the poets and then um, Joe will be continuing to introduce poets. Our first poet is Gail Mitchell. And she is also a quilt maker and a fan of the Geraldine R. R. Dodge Poetry Festival. She lives in Hamilton. Hello, I'm going to read three poems to you. The first one, they all come from prompts from Anna's class. And the first one is called Gun. I fancy getting one in the shadows of any hood Maybe an alleyway, meet a thug undercover, scared shitless, password, cock a doodle doo, silencio, my grip tight on the shank, cold phallic shaped tool, shifting palm to palm, not a derringer, not a revolver, but a glock. The second one is called Places Lived. Eight distinct homes, more and more suburban, encroaching into communities. Us, non-white, yet keeping the faith. Eight neighborhoods over 53 years ain't bad. We're not supposed to be here, way beyond senior citizen and black at that. I often think of Entozaki's Shanghai's for, gullet, for colored girls who have considered suicide when the rainbow is enough. Screw that rainbow. And my last one is called Real Estate Not For Sale for Anne with an E. It's an abecedarian, so listen carefully because each consecutive line begins with the next letter of the alphabet. Art consumes her every waking day beyond the stained glass rectangular facade, come inside, cross the multicolored portal, portal decorated with vertical Mondrian glass, 
enter the foyer with his bulbed chandelier. Fairly ordinary interior, 16 steps leading upstairs. Go right into the first floor guest bedroom, heralded with first edition children's books, inked postcards, bingo board games, just opposed with overflowing baskets of yarn. Kindly rest yourself on the Woodrow Wilson lounge chair presented to long retired husband. Move on up those wooden stairs into the loft, no less overwhelming with crocheted Afghans overhanging the banister and walled ladders. Perhaps you have the nerve to peer into her studio, quilts waiting to be sandwiched by machine, ready for embroidery thread and aura filled silks. Sit on her wheeled chair, take a quick whirl, turn into her closeted computer space, unusually covered floor to ceiling with authored veterans of poetry, Angelou, Clifton, Komanyaka, watercolored originals peek out between the shelves exactly like she wants them to. Visibility the key. You interested in making an offer? Zero chances she will sell. Thank you. Great. Okay, our next, our next reader is Hannah Fox, who lives in Montgomery. Her plays have had staged readings and workshop productions in New York and Princeton. She recently published her first book of poems, Looking Through the Far End of the Telescope, A Life in Verse. Thank you, Elaine, and welcome to everyone. I also am going to read poems that were from prompts from our workshops in the summer and fall. The first one, the prompt was choose a poem you love and write a version that updates its title in some fashion. On being nobody. If I'm nobody and you're nobody too, we're in good company, striving to be somebody to others who are nobody. It might be nice to be a tortoise. It might be nice to stay in place after beating out the hare in that much applauded race. And thank you, of course, to Emily Dickinson. And it was easy to have a title because her poems are without titles. The next poem is an American sonnet. And the American sonnet is looser. It doesn't require a rhyme scheme or specific meter as the 14 line traditional sonnets do. But this still has 14 lines. American sonnet on walking the dog during the pandemic. It used to be so easy, just put on collar and leash, take newspaper wrapper or two and out the door. Breathe in fresh air, smile at kids playing, amble along, stop to schmooze with neighbors at corner, let her choose the way, sniffing and doing what she does. Now it's a production, put face mask around neck, fill pockets with sanitizer cell phone, suck in breath, Walk quickly, afraid children will come too close. Greet no neighbor except masked at a distance. At corner, tighten leash and say a firm stay. Look left, right, choose way with fewer people. Adjust mask across mouth and nose. Get ready to go. Loosen leash, say okay, cross over and pray. Now the next poem was with a prompt to start a poem with either I love or hate and to come up with unusual extended similes. And this evolved into the breathtaking sense of awe that only happens once in a while. Seeing elephants in the wild on safari, enthralled by the way they stood together using their bulk to protect one another, waving their trunks for food, 
flapping their ears in response to herd mates nearby. Hearing Nathan Milsheim play Tchaikovsky's Violin Concerto in D major, when the music flowed into my arms, then pulsed through my entire being, and I felt the imperative of having music in life. Tasting apple strudel at the Neue Gallery in Manhattan, reminding me of when I was six and sat on that high stool in the kitchen, watching grandma perform magic as she made strudel for us. Feeling the soaring of the glider plane after being towed into the silent air, engulfed in blue among white clouds and looking at the green earth below, touching my newborns right after giving birth, when all sensations of pain evaporated and I felt as I hadn't before and haven't since in sync with the universe. And my final poem is, is when I find it, my final poem is a free verse poem in couplets. The Trouble with James. You must never go down to the end of the town. A. A. Milne, Disobedience. Firstborn oldest brother James, you were always getting in trouble the two of us more temperamentally alike, with brother Nathan caught in the middle. The son, who never gave me any trouble, said our mother with a chuckle. As she rolled her eyes and remembered how you took that radio apart and left it for rubble. Remember when you caught me and locked me out there on the roof of your attic bedroom to teach me a lesson, but you got in trouble because I cut myself pounding on the glass, let me in. And remember the time you couldn't stop me from going to that dance without a date? You got so mad you broke the hall bench, so you got in trouble while I went to the dance. Recently, the three of us met, you, Nathan, and I, and posed for a picture at the San Diego Zoo. There we were, 253 years of us standing side by side, smiling and thinking, no doubt, how lucky we were all to still be alive, with you and I, James, still getting in trouble. Thank you. Thank you so much um, for recalling all our prompts in class um, so, so well. Um, our next reader is our co-host, Joanne Sutera, who writes poetry, short stories, and flash fiction reflecting today's crazy world. She lives in Lawrence. unmute myself, thank you. Okay. Um, many women love shoes. I know I do. And even though I can no longer wear stilettos, I love how they look. And they are so naughty. So this first poem is called Ballet Pink Suede Pump with tea strap and hot fixed crystals. Rain falls as I pause at the display in Saks Fifth Avenue's window, causing me intermittent palpitations. I covet Jimmy Choo's latest sexy shoe, like I desire an exquisite work of art. Four inch heels touted as the perfect pump for day wear. I only hope crutches are an accessory. Hot fixed crystals and patterned pearls to the toe and strapped to my ankles. Should I wear other jewelry with this much glitz? T straps and zipper closures conjure up SM foot fetishes. Masked men groveling at my feet, inhaling earthy cow leather and fondling the taut straps. 
the image increases my palpitations. Mon Dieu, only $1,750. Surely insur insurance coverage is required. But shaking my head, I walk away, my soaked sneakers squishing in the rain. This second poem is a memoir list poem that uses repetitions. It's called, Let Me Set the Record Straight. Maybe it was the tuxedo. You appeared like a confident and sexy Bruce Wayne. Maybe it was the raid at the After Hours Club in Harlem that first night we met. Maybe it was your high voltage smile folks greeting you by name as cops shoved them into paddy wagons. Maybe it was nights at the once famous Jilly's nightclub where your brother usually invited us to hobnob with Frank Sinatra and his entourage. Maybe it was attending Hair or any other Broadway show gratis because you knew the vendors. Maybe it was instructions from Frank Costello at the bar I waitressed. Seat me in a corner, honey, against the wall. Nothing near windows or doors. Maybe it was the photo in the daily news of your pal's body stuffed in the trunk of a car parked on Riverside Drive. Maybe it was those limo rides with that crazy Hungarian betting on jockey tips at racetracks from New York to Maryland. Maybe it was late night calls from the loan sharks demanding at least the big because you reneged on your gambling debts. Maybe it was flying home to California with my two babies on stolen credit cards to visit my sister and brothers. Or just maybe you were the price I paid for entree into your world as a sheltered small town girl who yearned to experience life. Okay, my last poem uses vivid images to tell, tell a story. Who said life is fair? At 3.37 in the morning, I stretch my body across the bed to your side, like a puppy looking to snuggle against your warm back. I breathe deeply to inhale your familiar scent, a lingering Balenciaga, and something else I could never identify. And I feel the cold sheets. From the living room, I hear the soft hum of the TV. I rise knowing you'll be curled on the leather sofa asleep while those European soccer players you idolize flash across the screen, the new gods of your spent youth. At first I don't see you, then I do, on the carpet jammed between the couch and coffee table like crumpled old pillows hastily stuffed into an empty space your face contorted with red rug burns, your body lying in a pool of urine. I move the coffee table and roll you over. You babble incoherent words and drool leaks from your lopsided mouth. Once more, I'm back in nursing school in an old familiar film looping through my brain running for an instructor to explain what happened to the patient in room 209 whose face drooped and froze in the middle of a word I can no longer recall. Thank you. Thank you. Um, our next reader is John Bing, who comes to us from New Mexico, where he moved several years ago. But his community of poets remain in New Jersey. His book of poetry, Time Signatures, is due out in March from Kelsey Press.
Well, hello, everyone. Um, it's good to be with you from a snowy New Mexico, like looking out the window, it's snowing here. Um, I, I can't compete with the, neither the sexiness nor the drama of the, of Joanne's poems, but I'm, I'm going to take you back, well, take me back maybe, to uh, Afghanistan where I was a Peace Corps volunteer. And this poem recalls a, a moment in a town called Razni in the winter of 1966, and it's titled The Water Carrier. At the door, an old man with a dirt gray turban and a blanket wrapped around his body carried a sheep bladder filled with water over his shoulder into the dark mud-walled house to fill a basin. Then given a few small coins, departed somewhere to fill again his burden. I sat with new friends in full winter, eating dried fruits on a low covered table, while underneath a bochari with hot embers kept the cold at bay. Later, one of them brought me to a tea house and we sat for hours as a waiter filled our pot of tea from copper samovars our first cups sugared. I tasted sweetness fade to bitter at the last cup. Then I leaned back and saw the beauty of the cold Hindu Kush, the long reach of mountain streams and smelled soot in the air from a thousand fires. In memory, Razni will lie always in that winter when pomegranates from the bazaar froze solid, and an earthquake turned the hotel chandelier into a long pendulum swinging between my past and my future. If I had known what was to come, I could not have done differently. Once a pack of dogs followed me until, backed against a mud wall, I threw an imaginary stone, as I do now. The dogs fled. The, uh, my second poem actually occurs here uh, in this country. Uh, it's a memory of, uh, of a man that uh, I knew most of my life, who was my teacher of Dari. And uh, I, was, I was close to him and when he died, uh, I was invited to the Islamic future, uh, funeral in uh, California. It's titled The Wind, The Dust, in memoriam Mohammed Isan Entezar. The day is hot and a dry wind blows. I stand with many men in three lines facing the beer. The mullah's cloak flutters in the wind. After instructions, we stand together in silent prayer. The men make a bowl with their hands. Then the body of my old friend is carried by the men to the deep grave. The mullah asks for three men from the family to descend to the grave to receive the body. Dust blows in the hot wind around the grave. Three men drop into the opening. The mullah instructs them to receive the body how to lay the body down facing Kaaba. The men lift the body wrapped in a white kaftan from the bier, gently placing it in the proper position. They are pulled out. The mullah and one of the family speaks surahs from the Quran. The mullah turns to us and says, there is a grave for each of us. It awaits us. He instructs the three to throw dust into the grave. They beckon me to follow, and I take a handful of dust. I throw it to my friend, and the wind throws it back to me. The third poem, and the last one, is very brief. And it, uh, it's uh, from New Mexico. As I sit here and look at the snowfall at my window, I see a juniper bush which I uh, 
uh, saw when we first moved here. And, uh, and after looking at it for a while, I wrote this poem. Juniper bush. This one juniper bush, rooted solitary in the desert, home to a flock of bluebirds last week, now swings its limbs excitedly in the whirling desert gusts, like Vishnu as Bernstein, conducting the wild symphony of the air. Thank you all. Okay. Um, our next reader is Gina Turner, um, who lives in Lambertville. She is a professor of psychology at a community college in Pennsylvania, and she is grateful to the community of poets that she has gotten to know in the last few years. Thank you. So my poems are also all from prompts from Anna's class, but I don't always remember what the exact prompt was. Um, oh, am I unmuted? I'm muted. Okay. <laughs> I got a message on my computer. So this first one is in, uh, an ABC Darien, and it's called Ways to Exercise Futility. Apply anti-aging cream. Browse the internet. Cook, eat, wash the dishes. It's a sucker's game. Drink too much, take drugs, sleep around. Exercise. Find pleasure in a moment of respite. Get a tattoo. Hate the player while not hating the game. Diet in the face of just do it. Learn to knit. Learn to tango. Learn to play the guitar. Whack a whack-a-mole. Take detailed notes. Run on a hamster wheel. Plant annuals. Question authority. Rely on the police, the politicians, your degree to get you a job. People, not to be stupid. Sub in for Sisyphus. Take tap lessons. Hang up your clothes, vacuum, write a poem, stay friends with your ex, wash your hair, seek a state of Zen. Here's a koan for you. The arc of the universe is long and it bends toward the heat death of the universe. So the next poem is a poem based on an animal. And this is a fable called How the Penguin Lost Her Flight, based on a true story. In prehistoric times, penguins could fly. In prehistoric times, some penguins were large and as tall as humans. They were known as the Waimanu, and Sphenisca was their benevolent queen. One day, news of interlopers reached the kingdom, swarms of yellow-crested rockhoppers from the east. Sphenisca ordered a waddle of warriors to take to the skies, their wings an invisible warper. But the crafty rockhoppers had long abandoned the clouds for the sea, and a raft of thousands stormed the beaches and ravaged their food supplies. Sphenisca called a summit, sent messengers to all the other clans, the Humboldt, the Magellanic, the Macaroni. To the southern ocean they flew, regal fleets of countershaded torpedoes, until, nearing land, the rockhoppers struck, skimmed the surface of the waves, disturbing the food fish below. They created havoc in the oceans. If we can't beat them, join them, said Sphenisca, and she lumbered to the shore, levered herself belly first into the lapping waves. We float, she gacked and the waddle fell in around her and the gax grew deafening. The rockhoppers, seeing these massive birds and their allies, had learned their trick, fled back east. And the Waimanu, reveling in their new habitat, forgot to eat due to their excitement and grew smaller and smaller and smaller. And the flush of discovery stained their cheeks bright orange. Uh, the next a uh, poem is called Cello Suite Number no. One in G Major on a de Desert Island. Stranded on a New Yorker cartoon of a desert island with only a cello for company, 
I learned to play the prelude of Bach's cello suite number one in G major. You know it. For the palm tree whose fronds tremble in time with my vibrato fingers. Notes soar to the seabirds who swoop like my bow above the strings, which are taut like the beams of sunset. Holding the bow lightly, it floats in my hand, jetsam on the surface of the ocean. Music radiates an ember glow like the fire that keeps me warm. The instrument's driftwood colored curves echo the edges of the shore. Its sun warmed wood felt through my wind and water tattered clothes. The thrum of the low notes vibrates like when the water pounds its fists against the rocks felt in my first chakra in the base of my spine. I sway, hug the ribs of my cello's body. Its voice becomes my voice, a lament, a paean, a prayer, a sob of pleasure, a moan of pain, a gasp, a hesitation, a grunt, a rasp, shouts of slander, glissandi of gossip. No one will rescue me if I talk such trash. And finally, with the harmonious pang of the last two notes, a wail of loneliness, a cry for connection. And the last poem is about my dog. <laughs> and it's called A Walk with Brian. And, and this is a high bun, I will say also. A Walk with Brian. Cotton candy tail a wag, my fine furred friend trailblazes the forest path. Shade from the leafy trees mitigates the weight of the day's humidity. Too early for mosquitoes, we must be sentries against ticks. Sniffs of enthusiasm and curiosity yo-yo him forward, then behind, then toward the brush, as he splashes himself all over this brown and green frontier. The part of your brain devoted to smell is 40 times greater than mine. Tongue a lol, eager for a drink, he reaches the river, his twig legs, usually dignified by his frothy cream-colored coat, exposed by immersion. He ignores the small sticks we throw, which escape down the soft current. He prefers his own pursuits to lap and splash, weave back and forth along the verge of the beach, up and down the rocky shore. Your world is so much bigger than mine could ever be. Thank you. Okay, and Pat Hardigree is next. She began writing when she was 12 years old, and she's associated with the Delaware Valley poets since the 80s. She says, fellow poets helped her to develop her craft and keep writing. Pat lives in Bordentown, and worked in IT for the state of New Jersey. Pat, you're muted. Hi. Yes. OK. I'm unmuted now, but that little thing won't go away. All right. Uh, it's good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Passion Fish. Uh, this is a title I actually take, took from a film, and uh, it really doesn't seem to match the poem, but I think it does. I hear that certain fish can fly. They're at home out of the water. That certain men can love a woman like a large bird embracing flight. I hear that such things are true, but it's as uncommon as the rarefied air high above the tops of mountains. I hear the rush of a great bird's wings as it circles the mountain, looking for a home and rest and finding there is none. And I'm reading several small uh, short poems. Uh, Love Knots. Of love knots. When love uplifts its horrid head 
and beckons to where fools are led. Turn also the other cheek to swat. Patiently unravel your lover's knot. Not that you would not choose to love, nor that you could not lose to love, but that it is an awful pit. Oh, so sweet to be drowned in it. And uh, here's one about dolphins. No one seems to like this, but it's one of my favorites because I associate, I love swimming and diving and I don't do a lot of diving anymore, but uh, I always lo love to go uh, skin diving. In the blue green, oh, the title is Skin Diving in Key West Looking for Dolphins. In the blue green water, I'm looking for dolphins, elusive, playful dolphins. I descend to the coral sandy floor. Bottom fish dart like little pistons. A stingray cruises by. An out of season lobster waves his claws. I salute him, not looking for you. The lobster flails, or is it screaming? Immersed in sunshine and water, looking for dolphins. The lobster hails me. Story of my life, by the way. Yes, yes, indeed. And um, it's three. And uh, I've lost count of, I've lost count of the time. So uh, this is a really old one, and and I wanted to to read poems that I particularly like or that I. Uh, Father of my fathers, I know you. When I am running, win upon my face, the trace of you lift in my stride. In my sleep, heart pumping, blood weeping, you would gnarl beneath my bones. When I was a child, I cried out, arms stretched, mouth open, to the aloneness of this unfamiliar wilderness. You were not there. At the ends of dreams, I found you. Fragmentary glimpses through weighted veils, impressions in clay smoothed over. Where I go walking, there you are. The warmth of my breath, the strong, the strong spiny columns of my mind's eye. I am held up. I know your face, and once again, this long departed child in a strange land will greet you, father. And I have, um, I don't know how much time, some haiku, and I'll read a few of these. Small wisp of beauty beyond my entrance door, morning sunshine. Water rushes by, debris like so much clutter sweeps past. And this is a high bun, which is um, a haiku, followed by two seven cylinder uh, syllable lines, and, it, and it's called a high bun. Ladybugs gather in the room's corner ceiling. It's cold outside, so hard to make them leave. I will wait for them to go. And uh, when I reach the top, I think I see the earth from the beginning. A mountain I often climb, my eyes melt from so much beauty. And another I titled, My Dear Love. The full, the full moon in spring, the stars on a dark night, firefly lights. And a large butterfly dances on my violet petunias. I watch respectfully. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Pat. I now turn um, the stage, as it is in Zoom, to Joe, who will introduce the remainder of our readers. Okay, so our first, our first read, uh, reader is Kathy Kretschy, and she is coming to us uh, uh, by video because uh, she could not attend. Kathy has studied poetry with B.J. Ward, Jean Hollander, and Anna Evans. She serves on the advisory board for the Rutgers University Writers' Conference and lives in Hopewell Township. Here is Kathy. Kirsten, I'm not hearing anything. Good afternoon. Self-Portrait, 1969. I am a child of the Sonoran Desert, reluctant transplant who took root in its rocky pain and beauty. My right hand braced a fall bled, and then sealed in its palm red-brown pebbles from this earthscape. I held my breath under the light of the sun, and like the prickly pear and saguaro, breathed in only when sheltered by night. I learned how to shrivel in drought, grow the spines of self-protection, and thick skin to present, prevent desiccation. When the monsoon season brought rain, the rushing of the desert washes and gentle sharp dampness of water drunk by the thirsty ground released the warm nosegay of creosote and sagebrush. The smell of the desert infuses my bones. Grandma's laughter. I still have a black and white photo of me, a two-year-old in dress and bonnet, running away on stocky legs from grandma chasing me on a Chicago sidewalk. We are both smiling and laughing. Some 10 years later, my brothers, my mom or me, would place grandma's walker at the car door, our arms bracing hers under the soft flap of skin and thinning bone. We lifted her, letting go only when she could bear her own weight. In those days, she still played cards with us. Hours of pinochle followed by pig a simple game that sent Grandma into spasms of laughter and me giggling until my sighs hurt and I was crying. I can still feel Grandma's soft face as I kissed her, her hands, her arms, her flesh and bone, spirit expressed in form. My sense of her remains long after death. After the conference, Phoenix, Arizona. Meet life at street level beyond the lobby. Leave the tchotchkes in your room, the plush coyote and the keychains. Leave everything but the water bottle. Oh, and bring a hat if you have one. You're no longer a kid browned by the summer. Take the 17, catch it at Central Avenue. You won't be able to read the schedule, the print bleached by relentless sunlight. Be prepared to wait in your too warm clothing. The bus comes every 45 minutes. Take it 20 stops past the strip malls and auto zones. When you get off, you will know the smell of damp desert warming in the morning. The crosswalk at the edge of the city will be empty, white and wide, waiting for developments to intrude. The sky will be missing the comfort of clouds the palaverity and apparition, its branches raised like bones of a skeletal hand into the empty blue. Grief will strike you. You can't leave. Finding soul. Lingering at the dinner table, laughter, breathing out a forest, a blanket, 
a story, not a shining city on a hill, untouched and untouchable, a hand, arms, your body. The soul inhabits and tenders its being to anyone who can feel the hardness of body dropping away. I saw two dandelions on the side of the road, holding on to summer as the darkness deepened into winter. Brash yellow, these two soul sisters standing together in happy defiance, two little sons holding their own against the flashing of time. A day in the life of a gull at Island Beach State Park. There is a soft draft today. I ride it without moving a wing, letting myself float and hover, loving the view below me. I dip slightly, veer downwards, alighting on the sand below. Holding my wings tight to my body, I lunch on a lone crab leg. I see some old friends gathering. As fast as my bird legs can take me, I hot foot it over to meet them. After a little chatter, we take off. Flying in formation, the five of us skim over the waves of waves. The sun glazes the water. Rippling blue rushes beneath us. We peel off towards the shore and beyond to where the forked river spills its holds of frogs, dragonflies, and minnows into the bay. And finally, my last poem, Baseball Stadium, 2020. I miss the security guards, the beer vendors, the ushers, auditioners singing the national anthem off key, poor people lined up after a game for pickup work, hot dog wrappers, half eaten nachos, abandoned souvenirs. I miss the kid with the ice cream hands, the big bellied man sloshing beer, the boos and cheers and screams, the harangues about some player's mother. But I am not alone now. I am being breathed again. Cardboard cutouts are watching the game. Enlarged photos, life size, and sitting in my big lap at the field level, in the nosebleed seats, in the mezzanine. These are memorial cards, but not slipped into a musty missile or a sticky drawer. The dead and the living Morning and joy are gathered around the field of play, silently watching with sunglasses, hats, and foam fingers. The six-year-old girl who slept with her glove before dying of strep. The high schooler killed at Parkland, paired with his dad, who tolerated games but loved his son. Families separated by generations now sit together, and the animals too, a beloved Labrador retriever who missed bark at the park, Charlie O the mule, late mascot of the Oakland A's who roamed the field before games some 50 years ago. I am now a spirit holder, a refuge from death. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kathy, virtually. Our next reader, Edith McGowan. Edie lives in Princeton. As a youth, she wrote in journals. She started writing a mystery novel, which I remember, then detoured to poetry. She has published poems in US One, Summer Fiction Issues, US One Worksheets, and Kelsey Review. Edie McGowan. Okay. Hello. Um, let me see. I write mainly Bella poems. Do you get me? Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, I write mainly Bella poems. She's my alter ego, which allows me to write about my life, but also mixed in fiction. I like to write in poetic forms. My first poem is a villanelle. 19 lines and a set rhyme scheme. Bella losing her memory. Most of Bella's life, she had a problem with her memory. Must always carry a notepad and pen. 
whatever she's doing, write it down instantly. Walks midway across the room. Her mind is blank, weary. Writes a daily to-do list. Where, why, what, who, and when. Most of Bella's life, she had a problem with her memory. Hopes it's not dementia, such as Alzheimer's, scary. Bella is frightened it's happening more often. When she makes a shopping list, shopping list, write it down instantly. Writes down where she's driving to routinely. Or like Gone with the Wind, it's forgotten. Most of Bella's life, she had a problem with her memory. Bella writes down the time of her doctor's visits promptly. Easy crossword puzzles might help her memory sharpen. When she thinks up lines to a poem, better write it down instantly. Bella hates to admit her memory loss is worsening daily. Considers taking as, as seen on TV, Miracle Pill Prevagen. Most of Bella's life, she's had a problem with her memory. Better make a will, write it down instantly. My next poem is a triolet sonnet. 14 lines like a sonnet. It has its set pattern of repeating lines of triolet. Same old morning news. Bella only half listening. A quick snip on the morning news. Cops, bad drug bus, dog or something. Bella only half listening. Shooting, robbing, people dying. She turns it off, has things to do. Bella only half listening. A quick snip on the morning news. Words people immune to hearing. Bella only half listening. Investigate, cops lying. Cell phone shows the truth, breaking news. Bella only half listening. A quick snip on the morning news. And my last poem is a rondo. 14 lines, it has one repeating line and rhymes. The day mare of Bella's broken laptop. Bella's day mare. She drove to the library, brought home more books, made cup of hot cocoa, excited to type a rondo. Should have known things are going too smoothly. Her screen suddenly off its hinge, needed to be fixed quickly. Best Buy, tech, replacement, screw, and stock. Sorry now, Bella's day mare. Tech squeezed old screw in, screw too far back, couldn't see on Zoom. Leaned over camera maybe, old habit reached up to shut it, whoa. Caught herself and bent it back easy in right place, concluding Bella's day mare. Thank you. Thank you, Edie. Steve Smith. Steve, who earned a BFA at the School of Visual Arts in New York City, has had his poems appear in Patterson Literary Review, Midwest Prairie Review, Nerve Cowboy, and The Barefoot Muse. Steve lives in Pennington. Thanks for the introduction, Joanne. Um, it's an honor to be here with all these amazing poets. Um, I wanted to start off by reading a post office poem Right after getting out of the army in 1969, I got a job with the US Post Office. So here is an imagined version of my resignation form. To Mr. Postmaster, RE, resignation, April 11th, 1976. Please accept this letter as notice that I will be resigning from my job carrying mail at the Richfield Post Office starting immediately. I want to thank you for the Orwellian atmosphere and oppressive surveillance over the course of the last six years. Thank you for encouraging me to increase my alcohol consumption and blood pressure and for giving me a deeper understanding of what it means to go postal. <laughs> Frankly, I'm so tired of my job security being based on a possibly product 
impossible productivity goals that only a machine could meet. Tired of being followed on my route by postal inspectors in unmarked cars while I march up and down hills and steep staircases, letting neither snow nor heat nor gloom of night stay me from the swift completion of my appointed rounds. Tired of seeing you, Mr. Postmaster, staring at me and checking your wristwatch every time I go to the bathroom, and tired of the one-way postal inspector spying the sky mirrors in the ceiling that hover over me every day while I case my mail. Not to mention, I'm tired of the customers who keep unleashed guard dogs on their porches, creating a climate of mistrust, fear, and anxiety that made it such an oppressive ordeal to come to work each morning. So if I can do anything to help you warn my replacement and make the transition as much of a pain in the ass as it was for me to work for you, please let me know. Second poem. This is a poem about moving and leaving a, a house and all the life that, 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 that that's, was contained in that house. Before you lock the door, before you lock the door, take one last walk through the old brick colonial. Before it was your house, it belonged to the Snyder family. Before that, the original owners were the Thompson family. At one time, you got married in the living room before your wife's illness came, before you spread her ashes in the county park near Trenton, where she grew up. Walk up to the attic and smell the faded scent of varnish and oil paint and make sure you didn't leave behind any sable brushes, prime canvas, or that old copy of Robert on Rye's The Art Spirit. Then go check the bedroom closets to see if any rings or watches or those seashells from the Jersey Shore that once adorned the drawers and night tables might be hiding there. After that, go down and check to see if you removed all the bags of cat litter in the basement and make sure the furnace is turned off. At one time, three kittens, Sammy, Kelly, and Pumpkin, were born here. After that, check the garage and make sure all the metric wrenches, hammers, and spackle knives that you plan to use again are not still there. After making sure all the windows and side doors are locked, Stop and take a deep breath of the house's, house's familiar aroma. Step out onto the front lawn under the dappled shade of the sycamores to take one last look at the house you owned over the past 25 years. And finally, close the front door. And after you get done locking it and seeing your reflection in the front window peeking back at you, run your hand softly over the door handle, the brass knocker, the door frame and its moldings and mullions. Um, here's an ekphrastic poem. Um, imagining I am Chaim Soutine at the Louvre. I feel it's my destiny to be standing there in the grand cavern of the Louvre, there's pondering Rembrandt's painting, Slaughtered Ox. My spirit in turmoil as I wonder if there is any meaning behind the work, if it was just a dead ox, or if my very soul resided somewhere in the painting. Infused with Rembrandt's swift lines and the way they give the painting coherence with thick strokes and glistening varnish that makes the big chunk of meat with its flayed ligaments and bloody tendons come to life. It stirs memories of the Russian shtetl of my youth, the slaughter of livestock, the, the pogroms, the village students who bloodied my face for making caricatures of the local rabbi. My father warning me not to become an artist. All of it swirls in my mind. Then in the Louvre, I become swept up in, ex, in an ecstatic frenzy and see my brush swirling like a tornado of revenge against my oppressors, painting like a surgeon operating on the carcasses of plucked fowl and dead rabbits on hooks seeing their smooth, grease-smeared flesh and viscera as slabs of paint. Imagine how their stench would test my neighbors. I tell myself I will paint with whatever it takes, the discarded brushes that litter the floor 
of my studio back home, use palette knives, sticks, my thumbs, or my elbows if necessary. I'll string the chickens up by the neck and in my mind's, mind's eye see the fowl's beaks agape in deathly screams. The flayed rabbit spread out, the gutted fish with skin like yellow tin foil. And my last poem is a tribute to my first poetry teacher, who many of you might know. Title is A Tank Full of Poetry in Memory of Jean Hollander. I want to be in that Chinese restaurant when she pulls a mayonnaise jar full of a clear liquid out of her handbag and asks Kathy if she likes vodka. I want to hear her voice become musical as she reads Byron and Shelley to the class, then declares they had the power to cure all those who suffered from the lack of poetry. I want to see her eyes widen, then smile approvingly as I read my first poem about boxing with my father. I want to be there to hear her explain to Vita that she didn't spend hours before class on Friday preparing notes on Emily Dickinson or William Butler Yeats, but instead fixing her hair and choosing the right outfit and jewelry to wear to class. And lastly, I want to see her sailing into the YWCA parking lot behind the wheel of her boat-like Cadillac Coupe de Ville for Friday Poetry Workshop, her tank full of poetry. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. I am now going to introduce my co-host, Elaine Gutterman, who lives in West Windsor, owes her passion for poetry to Anna Evans, her classes at the West Windsor Art Center, and inspiring local New Jersey poets. She plans to submit her first poetry book manuscript shortly. Elaine, take it away. Okay, thank you so much. I think you can, um, those of you who are visiting can all appreciate how much, um, why I value my fellow classmates so much and how much I learn from, their, from them and their poetry. Tonight is the first night of Hanukkah, so I'm going to start with all small forgotten miracles of Hanukkah. These are the eight days of obsession when the lowly potato is elevated to high cuisine. Recipes for latkes multiply like stars in the sky at dusk. We search for traditional latkes like Bubby would make, even if Bubby did not cook from a recipe. We forage for new ingredients like leeks, sweet potato, or beets to boost color, flavor, and nutrients. Durable Eastern European potato, you survived the cold of the shtetl. Immigrants' passages to new lands, merging cultures, and the seductions of hummus, tacos, and spaghetti. I sink into the dirt from 10 baking potatoes as I wash and peel their skins. Then go all in to hand grate their firm bulbous flesh without donating my own. In the battle to achieve maximum crunch, I press 
the grated potato into a strainer and pause to allow its liquor to drain out. Add standards from eggs to matzo meal, though I texture with Asian scallions in place of onions. Frying is always a race against time, just enough to seal each mound with a golden crown, not so much to sear in grief. At the end, I gaze at trays heaped with dozens of crunchy latkes and wait for my eight guests. There is just enough time for the smoke from my kitchen to clear the house. Another small miracle. Next, I'm going to recall my water escapades of this past summer and fall. FYI, a single skull is a long, narrow crewing boat for one rower. I have never rowed a skull. Seated in my inflatable kayak, cresting the ripples of Carnegie Lake in a slow paddle, I chart the shore's greenery in its turn from gold to crimson. Each time the occasional skull flies past me, notably those piloted by silver-haired women, my imagination flutters wildly like a ring-billed gull. What if I owned one of those? Yet what about parade-like gulls? What about the rack to hold the skull? What about the car with roof bars to support the rack? What about the arm and shoulders to hoist the skull up and down the rack? And finally, where to find the affordable used skull? But let me follow my fantasy. A skull is the long-winged gull that transports me to the outer banks of my imagination, skimming over the lake, seated in a mechanism that orders every muscle from foot to shoulder to orchestrate speed, I fly the lake's distance beyond islands and bridges, clouds ogling my performance from their perch of blue. And the last poem is a walk in the woods. American sonnet of the defenseless woman. I learned to walk alone on urban streets, fast-paced yuppie in the starkness of night, staying centered, well away from lurking doors and alleys, eyes on lighted windows in case of need to scream in real, ingrained rape culture fright. Others cautioned, forget about late movies, 
hanging with friends, I ventured alone, backpack stuffed with fear, knowing I could fall prey. My beating heart stoked with hope, I could elude stalkers with wiles and speed. Now, seeking nature's habitats, I'm alone in the woods. Tall trees leave shade while birds serenade. Paths wind over streams. Frogs twang in bass notes. Yet, in the crack of a branch, the advance of a runner, rape culture seizes me, squeezing my beating heart. Thank you. Thank you, Elaine. Well, what can I say about Anna Evans? I'm going to, of course, read her biography. But she is our muse, our teacher, our instructor, our fellow poet. Um, Anna Evans lives in Hainesport, though she grew up, though she grew up in the UK. She gained her MFA from Bennington College and has garnered many prestigious poetry awards. Anna has published several books of poetry, including most recently, Under Dark Waters, Surviving the Titanic, The Unacknowledged Legislator, and The Quarantine Chronicles, of which she is an expert, Anna Evans. Hi, everybody. Um, what a joy this is. I really love um, reading uh, my, with my students. And I'd like to thank Elaine and Joanne for those wonderful introductions to everybody and for keeping everything running smoothly. And I'd also, of course, like to thank West Windsor Art Centre for hosting this reading. And I'd like to remind the audience that if you haven't already donated, there is a link to support the Art Centre. You know, it's difficult for art centres in times like these. Now, if you have enjoyed um, my students' readings as I have, it will be clear to you that um, I learn from them as much as I teach them. And so I wanted to read uh, four poems which basically were either inspired by my teaching or actually by my own prompts. Sometimes I write my own prompts. Um, so I'm going to begin with a villanelle that I wrote and my, my students were horrified when I told them this. I wrote in the car on the way to West Windsor, which is about a 45 minute journey uh, on a day that I was about to teach them about poetic closure. It's called Closure. I can't remember where I heard this law. Most matters should be opened like a curtain, yet mood permitting closed more like a door. In other words, the opening three or four exchanges set the stage, what you're asserting. I can't remember where I heard the law that by the end, all parties should be sure of how they feel. If one of them is hurting, then close the matter firmly like a door. If one is in a puddle on the floor, accusing someone special of deserting, I can't remember where I heard this law, then close the matter gently and withdraw. Though, if your aim's to leave the end uncertain, you push it too and don't quite close the door. You'll see, now I've set forth this metaphor, its scope is both substantial and diverting. I can't remember where I heard this law, but watch me close this down like a slam door. All right. Um, as you just heard, I usually write in meter and rhyme and form. But one of the things that's wonderful about um, working with a very diverse, eclectic group of poets is it pushes me outside my comfort zone occasionally. And so here's a poem that is none of those things. It's called After Teaching Merwin's Berryman, I Write a Poem Without Punctuation. I can do it, but it's alien to me, like figuring sums in base eight. The result looks wrong, even though I know there's only good and bad writing, or rather writing that works or doesn't work. 
then I realize losing those tiny marks, the commas, the periods, means you have to be more precise, consider fine nuances of meaning, and line breaks have to labor like adjunct instructors, doing more for no extra money, making connections. Precise is not the same as accurate. Adjunct instructors break. Berryman suicided. Why do we have 10 fingers? And so I just got over COVID. Seriously, I had the virus. I was in quarantine for 15 days and I was quite sick, not sick enough to be worried, but I was quite sick. And during that time, I had just set my class the prompt to write an abecedarian. You heard several of them. So I decided to write my own abecedarian. And here it is. Abecedarian for 2020. Apocalyptic years begin insidiously. Your best friend discovers she has cancer. And there's news from China about a mysterious, highly contagious disease. One minute, Australia declares a state of emergency and you turn on the TV to see fires raging. The next, there's a global pandemic and everyone's locked down at home. You play cards and drink wine. It gets worse. I can't breathe, says George Floyd with that cop's knee at his jugular. Your best friend, her name was Kim, dies. You turn 52 at a Black Lives Matter protest. The internet jokes, who had murder hornets for May? Not you. You're just trying to keep track of the cancellations. Olympics, Wimbledon, Lollapalooza, Broadway, and pretending to cope. You teach classes online. Quarantine follows quarantine and it's suddenly fall. Russia is again interfering in the presidential election. Spotted lanternflies are swarming Philadelphia. Trump claims credit for defeating COVID-19. The word unprecedented is meta-commentary. Finally, you get the virus. Shut yourself in the bedroom watching MSNBC. Wisconsin polls look good, but Pennsylvania, not so much. Experience tells you to trust nothing. You write a poem, this poem. You hope Hurricane Zeta will be the last disaster of 2020. It isn't. So, I didn't want to end on that poem because that's a bit bleak. And anyway, maybe Hurricane Zeta was the last disaster of 2020. So instead, I want to end on a funnier poem. And one of the things that we discussed uh, this past session was how to get over writer's block. One of my suggestions was to write a parody. So I'm going to read you a parody that I wrote of another poem that I love and that I've uh, taught in, in the class several times. The poem I'm parodying is W.H. Auden's Musée des Beaux-Arts, which is an ecrastic poem about a painting. Um, Steve mentioned uh, an ecrastic poem and indeed wrote one himself. Um, this is called Museum of the Impeachment. After W.H. Auden. About the Republic, they were never wrong, the founding fathers. How well they understood its vulnerability, how it could be taken down while the people are ordering off Amazon or streaming Netflix dully along. How, when the activists are reverently, passionately waiting for the miraculous vote, there always must be young people who did not specially want it to happen, eating avocado toast in a trendy New Brunswick place. Sorry, that always happens. Somebody <laughs> called me <laughs> while I was reading. Um, eating avocado toast in a trendy New Brunch place. They never forgot that probably the dreadful presidency must run its course anyhow on Fox News, the unlikely spot where the talk show hosts deny all facts, which is torture, and then cut to a story about a horse. In this impeachment, for instance, how everyone turns away quite leisurely from the disaster. The Republicans may have read the transcript, considered forsaken Ukraine, but for them, it was not an important failure. The sun shone as it had to on the House articles disappearing into the biased Senate and the expensive, delicate congressman who must have seen something amazing, a president abusing his powers, had an election to get to and sailed calmly on. Once again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming and Elaine, Joe and the West Windsor Art Center. I'll hand it back to Joe. And I will send it back to Elaine for her closing remarks. Thank you, everybody.
Thank you. Thank you, Anna and classmates for an uplifting afternoon of poetry. For some of us, reading our poetry has become an exciting adventure, while for others, it is still anxiety provoking. Yet all of us value the opportunity to give voice to our poems, especially in the presence of family and friends. We are grateful to Zoom for enabling us to gather and perhaps without the hassle of traveling, more of you are here than could normally attend. Again, thank you for your generous donations to the Art Center to continue arts programs and events like this. We wish you happy holidays, hopefulness, and good health. Thank you.